All right, so we have an expression for the osmotic pressure, which is a fairly simple equation to use, but we can work an example, see how it works, and also provide some uh, discussion for what the, the values in that equation mean. So for this example, let's say that we have a solution that is 0.1 molar in some solute. It might be a, a sugar water solution, 0.1 molar uh, sugar water solution. And if our temperature is 298 Kelvin, so our sugar water solution is at room temperature, that's enough information for us now to calculate the osmotic pressure. So the osmotic pressure of that, of that s solution is easy to calculate. C times R times T, 0.1 moles per liter is our concentration. The gas constant turns out not to be convenient to use the value of the gas constant in joules per mole Kelvin because what we're going to want out on the um, left side when we're done is a pressure with units of pressure, units of atmosphere, for example. So it's going to be more convenient if we use uh, a value like 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And if I multiply that by the temperature, 298 Kelvin, now Kelvin will cancel, moles will cancel, liters will cancel, and I'm left with just units of atmospheres. So, and if I work that math out, 0.1 times this value of the gas constant times 298, that works out to a pressure of 2.4 atmospheres. So as a numerical calculation, that's not a difficult calculation. The osmotic pressure for a 0.1 molar sucrose solution is 2.4 atmospheres. What does that mean physically? What it means is that if I have two beakers, one with a pure water solvent and one with 0.1 molar uh, solution, 0.1 molar in some solute and water as the solvent. That means that the height of this column will be enough that it's generating a full um, uh, 2.4 atmospheres worth of pressure. So either we can think of it as this, uh, the height of this column of solution weighs uh, it, its um, mass uh, force generated by its mass, mgh, divided by the area. That pressure is equal to 2.4 atmospheres. We can think of 2.4 atmospheres, if I convert that to units of tor, if I multiply by 760 to get units of tor, that value, I can think of it as 1900 tor, or the more old-fashioned name for a, the tor unit is a millimeter of mercury. So. This column will weigh as much as a column of 1.9 meters, almost two meters uh, high column of mercury. Or since mercury is much denser than water, if I were to have that column of water rather than mer uh, mercury, the density of water is, I think, 12 or 13 times larger than the density of um, water. Mercury is more dense than water, so that corresponds to a column of about 25 meters of water. So that illustrates that osmotic pressure is actually a pretty strong force. The, the, the pressure with which pure solvent will attempt to uh, pass through this semi-permeable membrane to dilute this 0.1 molar solution will be enough to support a column of water that is a full 25 meters high. So that's much larger than uh, just the size of two beakers in a lab, for example. And that's perhaps not all that technologically interesting a phenomenon. It happens all the time in biological systems, for example. But we usually don't want to uh, dilute a solution by allowing water or solvent to pass through a semi-permeable membrane. If we really wanted to dilute this solution, all we would have to do is just pour some extra solvent into that half of the beaker. Often where this becomes more interesting is, is in the reverse case. Let me go back to a case before the osmosis had happened. So here's 
two beakers separated by a semi-permeable membrane. In this case, I'm going to let the heights of the solution be equal at the start. Aqueous solution, 0.1 molar in some solute. Before osmosis happens, this is what the system looked like. If I allow osmosis to happen, the solvent will drop and the solution side will rise. If I want to prevent that from happening, I need to push down with an additional pressure equal to the osmotic pressure on this side. If I push down with pressure harder on this side than this side, if that osmotic pressure, if that pressure is equal to the osmotic pressure, 2.4 atmospheres, then I can keep these two sides in equilibrium. If I push less hard than that, if the atmospheric pressure here is P naught and over here I push with P naught plus pi, I'm in equilibrium. If I push with only atmospheric pressure or atmospheric pressure plus a smaller amount, then osmosis will occur. But what if I push with a pressure greater than P naught plus the osmotic pressure? If I push not with 2.4 atmospheres, but with 2.5 or 3 atmospheres, I can actually cause solvent to flow the other way. That's contrary to the direction thermodynamics tells us it will spontaneously flow, so I have to uh, provide energy for that to happen. That's why I have to exert so much pressure, more than two and a half atmospheres, to cause that to happen. But if, if the pressure on this side is greater than P naught plus pi, what will happen is solvent will flow in this direction. That process, because it's the opposite of osmosis, is called reverse osmosis. So if you exert a pressure greater than the osmotic pressure, you can cause the solvent to flow from the concentrated side to the dilute side, uh, reverse osmosis. So that's useful, for example, in purifying seawater. In many places around the world, uh, with uh, shortages of fresh water and an abundance of seawater, like many islands, they purify some of their water by this process of re reverse osmosis. They take seawater, concentrate it in some ions, exert a pressure and we can force pure water to flow through a semi permeable membrane uh, to get pure solvent water. Uh, Seawater has a concentration greater than 0.1 molar. It's also not an ideal solution, so the osmotic pressure isn't exactly concentration. We'd have to go back to an equation that used activity to get an accurate prediction for the osmotic pressure required to purify seawater. That value turns out to be 27 atmospheres. If you want to purify seawater, you need to exert 27 atmospheres of pressure to squeeze it through a semi-permeable membrane. But in fact, that can be an economical way to purify water uh, in some circumstances. So that's a summary not just of the calculations for osmotic pressure, which are relatively simple, but some of the uh, physical picture of, of what's going on. We've now covered four different uh, colligative properties, so the next thing we'll do is, is compare and contrast them in a little bit of a summary.